Isn't it another beautiful Lord's Day that God's given us and time to dig into His Word in Jeremiah 21 through 24 and consider the message given long ago that still fits today. Shepherds who would not lead and sheep therefore scattered in a time of disarray and upheaval, a continual decline with the kings as we've gone from Josiah who initiated the reform and then two of his sons and one of his grandsons would follow him on the throne and eventually Zedekiah would be the last ruler of Judah and Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon would come and take it all down and carry all the people away. I'm so thankful for each of you that are part of this class and welcome again to the ones sharing with us online. It does me so much good when you take the Word of God to heart, you study it, you dig into it, you learn from it, and you see how you can apply it. And that's exactly what Lynn Morstain has done by bringing me this uh, cake today. She was reading in Jeremiah 24 about the good figs and the bad figs, and it reminded her to make the good figs bread. It has dried dates, pineapple, apricots, rolled oats, oat flour, honey, and vegan butter. Isn't that nice? She tells me exactly how it's best served and with strong black tea or coffee. That's good to know, isn't it? The Word of God always transforms us, always challenges us, always confronts us with those things in our own hearts and lives and the things in our culture and our society that God would have us recognize and address in the very ways that he did in the time of this great prophet. Here's where we are so far. You can see coming up uh, next week, deserved destruction and divine deliverance, and then broken covenants and defiant disobedience. In bold numbers, you see the chapters that we'll focus on. And then, Lord willing, by the end of May, we'll go through the rest of Jeremiah and have two weeks for Lamentations as well. I'm going to call Jeremiah 21 a critical moment because at this point you can see desperation and destruction. It's likely about 588 BC when Zedekiah, the last king, has relied on Egypt to defend him and protect him and build up his forces against Babylon. And therefore, he rebelled against the ruling power. But as a result, they've camped around Jerusalem's walls. And for Zedekiah, where do you turn when you can't turn anywhere else? You've tried power. You've tried military. You've tried foreign alliances. You've tried other gods. You've tried all the resources, all the skills, all the people, everything you have. What do you do last if you're Zedekiah? You turn to God. Not first. But when all else fails, Jeremiah, would you please beseech the Lord to deliver us? The Lord is so kind. He's so wonderful. He's so generous and gracious. If you'll just ask him, we know that regardless of what we've done and how far we have fallen and how much we have failed, God, he's going to turn this thing around. Isn't that an important principle for us to recognize today? As we go through our own situations and circumstances, our temptations, our ups and downs, where do we turn first? And would we ever think that we could live out of harmony with God, doing our own thing in our own way, according to our will, and then when we're cornered and we have nowhere else to turn? Of course, the Scripture reverses all of that. The fact is that Zedekiah and those who preceded him had begun with submission to God. This issue with Babylon would never have taken place. So many times we face the consequences of our own decisions, our own choices, our own actions. And while we can look all around us and oh it's Babylon or it's Egypt or it's the lack of tools or money or resources, could be we first need to look at ourselves and ask on whom, on what do we rely? Where is our confidence? 
So let's look at Jeremiah 21 and these first seven verses. This is a different Pashur, not the same as the false priest we noted last time. Verse 2, the group says, Please inquire of Yahweh on our behalf. Nebuchadnezzar, warring against us. Perhaps the Lord will deal with us according to all his wonderful acts so that the enemy will withdraw from us. In other words, we won't have to face the effects of what we've chosen and what we've done. God can just take all that away. Then Jeremiah said, You shall say to Zedekiah as follows, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I'm about to turn back your weapons of war in your hands. They won't do you any good. I will gather them into the center of the city. I myself will war against you with an outstretched arm, hand and mighty arm, in anger and wrath and indignation, and strike down the inhabitants, man and beast. They'll die of a great pestilence. And Zedekiah... I'm going to give him over and his servants and the people who follow him. Pestilence. uh, Those who survived the city. Pestilence, sword, and famine. I'll give them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar and their foes. He will not spare them nor have pity or compassion. How could it ever be that when you ask God for kindness, you get a reaction like this? Isn't God always willing, always open, always lenient, always tolerant and patient, where all you have to do is just kind of say, hey, God, how about I bring you all my problems? Because Zedekiah and the people who are with him have done what they've done, what is remaining for them is the reaction that God gives and the judgment that God pronounces. So the guy that not only would Babylon fight against them, but the Lord himself would and hand them over to Babylon. Well, after this message to King Zedekiah, then in the next passage you have to the people as a whole and then the house of Judah. There's several times that this fiery, passionate preacher has to tell people, stop fighting. You will not win against this invading force. It is the will of God. It is the direction. It's the command of God that you submit and you go with Nebuchadnezzar into exile. And if you will do that, God will bring you through the exile. You will have suffered your punishment and then he'll take you back home. But if you shake your fist at Nebuchadnezzar, you're shaking your fist at God. And if you say, we're going to fight this thing to the death, that's exactly what will take place. You will die in the city. It must have been so shocking for God's people whom he redeemed from Egypt, with whom he made the covenant, whom he gave the commandments and the law, David had been on the throne. The temple, which was so precious to them, for God to say, I'm not going to defend you this time. I won't deliver you, no matter how you pray, no matter what you do, no matter what you promise to change. And for God to put his people in a position where they're going to be on the tail end, they're going to be defeated and overcome. How could that happen to the chosen people? The ones that have the house of God and the legacy and the heritage. And because they rely on all of those things while playing with the world, and with the immorality and idolatry of the nations around them, God says, in effect, you can't have it both ways. Now, if you turn over to chapter 7, 11 to 21, chapter 38, 1 to 6, there you'll see again the prophet saying, and that's why they accused Jeremiah of treason. That's why they hated him, among other things. First he said, you're going to be judged. Oh, no, shoot the messenger. And now you need to yield. You need to give it all up and let this foreign pagan power, this heathen Gentile king, do what he wants to do with you by taking you as captives into his homeland of Babylon. And then the house of David, that is the royal family, those that have descended from that great king. 
It's time to do justice. It's time to deliver the oppressed. It's time to provide for the people that are still under your leadership those things that please God and honor God and are right in His sight. So let's look at 21, starting at verse 8. You shall say to this people, this is for everyone, here's the same choice they've always had. Remember Deuteronomy, the two mountains, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Blessed are those who, and then boom, 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 and cursed are those who, and then you're in the valley in between. And then in Deuteronomy, Moses is led to say, choose life. I've set before you life and death. But the choice was the same in Jeremiah's day and for us now as well. He who dwells in this city, which is what they wanted to do, You'll die by the sword and famine and pestilence. But if you go out and fall away, that is, surrender to the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, who are besieging you, you'll live and you'll have your own life as booty. I've set my face against the city for harm and not good. The king of Babylon will burn this city with fire. Then verse 11 and following 12, the house of David. This is the other important principle that has never changed. We've said many times, what does the Lord require of you? Do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with your God. What would the Lord say to every king, every governor, every mayor, every ruler, every emperor throughout history? What would he say to the leaders of our land today and to those of the various nations around the world, administer justice every morning, deliver the person who's been from the power of his oppressor. You and I may think we lack influence. After all, we're not in charge of a great kingdom. We don't have a cabinet. We don't have a circle of people or thousands or millions listening to us for the next word. But each of us is in a position of impact for other people in our own circle, in our own community, in this congregation. And you and I can't decide for what everybody else will do, but we can administer justice. We can stand up for the oppressed and the needy and the burdened and the broken. And we could get so caught up thinking about what needs to happen with others, and we should, and pray for them. But God is still going to save the people in Jeremiah's day that obey Him. Obedience is going to be hard. They're going to have to face the music by going off to a foreign land, and the exile will last for 70 years, seven decades. But those who do, that obey God, they will get through it. And God will bring them back. Then this statement about the rocky dweller and the rocky valley dweller and rocky plain. Some suggest this is a metaphor. This is a picture. In other words, a person living in the valley thinks, I'm secure. No one can hurt me. I'm protected. I've got these mountains all around me. And maybe the people of Jerusalem are thinking of that. Maybe the king and the house of David and then the rocky plain. Well, I'm on a place where, again, no one can attack me. I've got solid uh, uh, security underneath me and around me, as if they're invincible. And then the image of a forest set on fire, that you can't find what you need in that valley or on that rocky plain. It will not deliver you from the wrath of God, which he's going to carry out through Babylon. This is an image of the Great Rift Valley. It's also called the Jordan Valley. It's east of Israel, where the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea are located, that great valley. And you can imagine that with all the things going on above, one could go closer and closer and closer to sea level and think, maybe I can escape all of that. The valley dweller the rocky plain. Now, let's turn also to 2 Kings chapter 24. 
Because here we're going to note side by side, it's important for us to remember, even though our Bibles are divided the way they are, where we have the books of history, like Kings, and then later we come to the prophets, that these events and characters and circumstances are simultaneous. So Jeremiah is preaching to the same people that were on the throne as recorded previously in our Bible. And so we understand some of the Bible is chronologically arranged, the books of history, basically so. But the prophets, not so. And because Jeremiah preached for more than 40 years to all of these kings, we're going to find his messages will touch on various incidents that we've read about previously. So as you look at chapter 22, you see that first the Lord is going to talk about Zedekiah. And then after him, Jeremiah will go back and he'll start with the three kings that preceded Zedekiah, but in the order in which they ruled. Let me say that again. He's going to do the last king first. Then he's going to go not to the one before him, but the first one. He's going to go king number four, and then he's going to go one, two, and three like that. Josiah was that faithful king who discovered again the law and called for fasting and mourning and repentance and obedience and the removal of all the idols and all the shameful practices of the pagan neighbors that had been adopted. But we've said before that even though he reigned 31 years and accomplished so much, that unless the people as a whole had adopted this desire to walk with the Lord and enjoy his blessings and peace and prosperity, unless they caught that message, then it's just a matter of time until the next king comes. And if he takes a different direction, the people are going to do what his administration prescribes. It's also always odd to me that you can have a great man like Josiah and that his sons not walk in his steps and his grandson. And you wonder how effective Josiah was as a father. The Bible never talks about this. We don't know. It could be that he exerted all of the instruction offered to them that he could and they just resisted it and rebelled against it and did their own thing. But as Judah takes its slide downward, nobody ever seems to say among his own relatives, remember Josiah, it was better for us then. We served God. We cleaned out all the junk that was sinful and wicked. And it was good. Let's go back to Josiah. Neither did his descendants learn from each other. So you go from one to another to another. And the steep, fast, hard fall and the crash at the bottom of the cliff, you see that it's all inevitable. So in 22, 1 through 9, here's Zedekiah, who's also called Mataniah. Several of the kings have more than one name. Sometimes the king of Babylon would put a man on the throne and change his name as he did with this man. The last king was Mataniah. Babylon's king said, I'm going to call you Zedekiah. Interesting, Zedekiah means Yahweh is righteous. Zedek, righteousness, and Yah, short for the name of the Lord. Son of Josiah, crowned by the king of Babylon, reigned 11 years and rebelled. Notice what uh, Jeremiah preaches to him. Verse 3, as we've noted, Do justice, righteousness, deliver the one robbed from the power of his oppressor, Do not mistreat or do violence to the stranger, the orphan, or the widow. And do not shed innocent blood in this place. That strikes me because you think God might say, issue this new decree. Change this law. You know, the way you're administering this department or this area or this part of your regime needs to... Instead, it's a matter of interpersonal treatment of those that are at the low end of the ladder, those who are being cheated by those above them, uh, those higher up in society. And so remember James chapter 1, right? Pure religion. Verse 27, is it? Pure religion. James 1. 
and undefiled is what? Visit the widows and the orphans in their affliction. And what's the second part? Keep oneself unspotted, unstained, uncontaminated from the world. Do you have true religion? Well, what if you interpret that in terms of widows and orphans and the oppressed and the neglected and the mistreated and the rejected? So when I hear Jeremiah preaching, I'm thinking about Zedekiah, but I'm thinking about Corey. And you're thinking about yourself. And what would God say we need to be sure we emphasize? I remember Galatians 2 and verse 10. When Paul had become involved in uh, collecting funds for the needy, famine-stricken brethren in Judea, when he met with the men that had been apostles before him, he said, they only asked, they only asked that we remember the poor, that we remember the poor. Could it be that Zedekiah represents the fact that sometimes the more power one has, the more he or she may feel I'm above the so-called little people, the ones that don't count, that don't really contribute to my image and my reputation and my rule. And then look at God's promise in verse 4. Here, with all of this, you know, the die is cast. The end is near. There's no turning back. Zedekiah is the last king. But look at this, verse 4. If you men will indeed perform this thing, kings will enter the gates of this house, sitting in David's place on his throne, riding in chariots and on horses, even the king himself and his servants and his people. But if you will not obey, I swear by myself, this house, this temple, will become a desolation. Wow. So there's still this windshield wiper, we call it. You know, here's what's going to happen. But as long as you have breath, as long as it's today, as long as there's a decision that you can make, make the right decision. Then, starting in verse 10, you have Josiah's son. So now... The, the, the first king after Josiah. So we went four, and now we're going one, and then two, and three after Josiah. Shalom is also called Jehoahaz. He was only three months in power, and Pharaoh Necho deported him to Egypt, where he died. What can you do in three months? What he did was wrong. Sometimes life is not a matter of how many years we have on this earth, but what we do with the short time that's ours. So that's why Ephesians 5 says, redeem the time. Cash it in for all it's worth. Don't let it slip by. If you have three months, if you have 11 years, if you have 31 years like Josiah did, that's not the way life alone is measured. Then after Shalom or Jehoahaz, you have Jehoiakim, also called Eliakim. He's another son of Josiah. He's a brother of the previous king. Eleven years died in Jerusalem. And then you have Jehoiakim. Two other names, Coniah, Jeconiah. He's a grandson, still in the family. Son of Jehoiakim, another three months, taken to Babylon and died. So let's go back now to 2 Kings and notice for a few moments what we see in the historical record. Chapter 23 begins with Josiah's covenant. Preceding this, the law had been rediscovered. You know, wipe the dust off of it. Where has it been? Ignored, unheard, unread, unpracticed for all of these years. And Josiah, just an amazing ruler, shows what someone can do from the top down. You know, many times we discuss about leadership, and we say it can't be all top down. Leadership has to take into account the needs of the sheep and the people. Listen to them. Be concerned about them. Draw them along with you when you're trying to lead them to a better place. 
But there are situations in which it has to start at the top. It's one of the things I appreciate about our elders. We're blessed to have the shepherds we have, aren't we? This congregation. Because you have that combination of certain things that, that have to be decided and then those things in which the needs of the people, the concerns, the thoughts, and the responses of people play such an important role as well. But first of all, under God, Josiah does what he does because of his reverence for Yahweh, the Lord. Well, he, uh, uh, look at verse 4 in 23, the, uh, bring out of the temple all those pagan vessels. You believe they had brought uh, objects of worship for Baal and Asher into the temple of the Lord? Burn them, Josiah said. Verse 5, get rid of the idolatrous priests. Uh, that uh, the kings had appointed to burn incense to the sun and the moon of the constellations. Get the Asherah out from the house of the Lord outside Jerusalem, the brook of Kidron. Burn it. Now imagine the public display. Look at the immoral practices addressed in verse 7. And then bringing out or bringing all the priests from the cities of Judah, defiling the high places, those shrines, those altars they had erected to false gods. You would think that would have been so public, so graphic, so effective that the influence would have continued on and on. And yet, then you see what follows the reign of Josiah. So you go back to the screen here, you can see Shalom, 2 Kings 23. After Josiah's death, Verse 31, Je Jehoahaz, 23 years old, a young man, three months, did evil in the sight of the Lord. So God sent Necho, imprisoned him that he would not reign, and imposed on the land a further tribute. More money demanded. Then you have Jehoiakim, if you look at chapter 23, 34 in 2 Kings, Pharaoh Necho now is the one in charge of appointing rulers. They're still in the Davidic line, but it's his decision because he thinks this man will pay the tribute. So he changed his name to Jehoiakim. And Jehoiakim paid the taxes. Don't you know that was great? Higher taxes, exacted silver and gold and Gave it to Necho. So Jehoiakim, 25 years old, reigned 11 years, did evil according to all that his fathers had done. Not his father Josiah, but that the preceding fathers had done. And then you have uh, this next king, Jehoiakim, Coniah, Jeconiah. And in 2 Kings, um, uh, well, you have 24, uh, Nebuchadnezzar coming, and Jehoiakim, his servant, turned and rebelled against him. And so, uh, 26, uh, verse 6, Jehoiakim slept, the king of Egypt. Then you have Jehoiakim, 18 years old, three months, and did evil. Then when you get to Zedekiah, chapter 24, 17, the king of Babylon takes the uncle, Mataniah, makes him king, renames him Zedekiah, and you can see again, he did evil. And so that was the last straw. That was the end of the road. This, that's why I called it cumulative momentum, like a snowball. Uh, something that may start small and then it builds and builds and builds. And all along the way, someone could stop it and reverse it, but they never do. Sometimes in our time, people call it kicking the can. You know, there's a decision that needs to be made, but, but someone doesn't have the courage and the zeal and the commitment to make it. So you just put it off. To, and so they never turn it back. And the result is as we see in Jeremiah. So just the time that Jeremiah's preaching, he's talking to these people. Well, what's the point? What good is going to come out of it? Well, the good will come that God will give them another opportunity to turn back, to reverse course, to get right with him, and then God would provide that blessing. Now let's go back to Jeremiah 22. If you look at verses 10 through 12, here's Shalom, Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah. And the reference to him is that um, he's dead and he's gone and so forth. Uh, 
the people still have forsaken the land and the blessings that came through uh, Josiah have been undone. And the results of uh, rejecting God will then lead to uh, the further consequences. So the good that he had done would not take place again. Then you have, uh, starting at 13, this Jehoiakim or Eliakim, and messages there given about seeking your own comfort, your house, using your neighbor's services, not paying him, uh, building cedar, which was quite popular in the time, but ignoring the afflicted and the needy. And verse 17, your eyes, your heart, intent only upon your own dishonest gain, shedding innocent blood, practicing oppression and extortion. And so you can see in 18, here's what's coming to Jehoiakim, this other son of Josiah. They won't even lament for him. He'll be buried with a donkey's burial. How would you bury a donkey? You know, most of those that reigned over Judah were placed in the tombs of the kings. And it was an honor. It was a sign of their prestige and people's remorse over missing them. But it would be so bad that he would not have any burial except that of a, of a common work animal, a farm animal. And so, uh, verse 21, you said, I will not listen. This is the way you've always been. The wind will sweep away your shepherds. Your lovers will go into captivity. You'll be ashamed and humiliated. How you will groan when the pangs come upon you like a woman in childbirth. Jeremiah, don't you know you're making your own situation worse? That it'd be a lot calmer if you said, well, I told them everything they need to hear. I've gone over it again, and they're not gonna, it's not going to make a difference. I think I'll just step aside and not face the pain. We said at the beginning of our study that the New Testament, when Jesus came, some thought he was Jeremiah. And perhaps this comparison as well, continuing to preach righteousness and faithfulness, to offer grace and demand repentance and threaten judgment. And so this uh, grandson, this last one noted here, this third after Josiah, grandson, son of Jehoiakim, three months, taken to Babylon, and there he died. Verses 24 through 30. So 28, when it says, this man, Coniah, that's this same individual. Write this man down, childless, a man who won't prosper in his days. No man of his descendants will prosper, sitting on the throne of David or ruling again in Judah. Perhaps most, if not all, men, and women too, want to leave a legacy. We want our children and our grandchildren to follow in the path that we believe is right. As Christians, it's vital that we think ahead. You know, our children are the missionaries we're sending to the next generation. And then our grandchildren. So the way we equip them and the way we direct them when we're gone, it's our prayer and our aim that we've so stacked the deck, I like to say. We've made it so emphatic that they'll want to walk in that same path that leads to heaven. They don't always. They have a decision to make. But imagine the instruction that here's a king that would die childless and would not have successors walking after him. Here's an image of the wheat and the chaff. Remember Psalm 1, the wicked are not like the wheat, but they're like the chaff that the wind blows away. The farmer would take the winnowing fork, which is like a pitchfork, toss it up in the air, and the chaff would scatter, and the wheat would come down. Chapter 23, I called uh, culpable ministers. And these have to do with Shameless shepherds and promiscuous prophets. When shepherds don't lead, sheep can't follow. Or when they do follow, they will be lost. There's a play on this word in verse 2, attend. God says, you've not attended to the sheep. So I will attend to you. Two different meanings. You haven't cared for the sheep. 
So I'm going to take care of you. There's also a play on the name Zedekiah. Notice in these verses the promise of the branch. You remember Isaiah 53 that he would grow up, the, the Messiah, like a, a shoot, a, a tender a branch. Or if you were to read Isaiah 11, 1 to 5, from the line of Jesse and David, ultimately this, this new David would arise. And it's clear it's Jesus Christ. And he will be called, the branch will be called the Lord our righteousness. What king? The last king had the same name in Hebrew as the Lord our righteousness. Zedekiah. So here's Zedekiah in name only, the Lord our righteousness. And that was a name given to him by a foreign king. But the branch, he will be the true, the Lord our righteousness. I've given you some scriptures there that uh, if you're getting the blog or you uh, can access these, you read all about the branch that will come. And then these promiscuous prophets. You have. Uh, their disgraceful conduct, their dishonest message, and their disrespectful attitude. The way they behave, uh, Jeremiah says, my heart is broken within me. My bones tremble. Why? Because the Lord is holy words. There are these adulterers, and uh, we can see the, what's happening in the land. Verse 11, the prophet and priest are polluted. Uh, even in my house, I've found their wickedness. That is in the temple. Their ways are going to be slippery. I'll bring calamity upon them. And then the prophets preaching in the name of Baal. How could it ever be? Committing adultery, walking in falsehood, strengthening evildoers. And none of them turn back. And here's that, like Sodom. No. No. There's a, there's a day and night difference between God's people and what happened in Sodom. The homosexuality, the immorality, the wickedness, the adultery, no. And now the prophet says, it's become like Sodom, like Gomorrah. I'm going to feed them wormwood, bitterness, poisonous water, because they polluted the land. The dishonest message, they keep offering false hope claiming a false authority and a false inspiration. We need words of hope, don't we? Aren't you glad that in the scripture there's always a message of hope? But if there's a message of hope that ignores sin, ignores righteousness, ignores holiness, that message of hope is going to fall flat. Hope comes through faith through dependence on God and walking in harmony with his will. And then authority, who put you in charge? Isn't it interesting? We live in a time when all kinds of people in our land are claiming authority. Listen to me, and some so radical, so far out, so different from the biblical norm, and yet people listen. Why? Because they sound authoritative. And then false inspiration. You know, God's given me this message. And Jeremiah says, no, the burden, your Bible might say oracle. The word literally means the burden. When a, when a, a, a prophet had a message that was heavy, that was hard, that was a, a load, it would be called a burden. I got this burden from the Lord, and I have to unload it. And this passage may have God saying, you're the burden. Don't you come asking God. Don't you come rejecting the true message he's given you. You want a burden? I'll give you a burden. You're the burden yourselves. Can a man hide himself? Can you see the guy hiding there? <laughs> One to find where's Waldo or something like that. This is what I had. Can a man hide himself? I want to ask myself that and you. Is, it, is there anything we do, anything we are that God does not see? And then the word of God, like a hammer that shatters rock. I like this picture because on the handle, it says Collins Axe. God's word. Sharper than two-edged sword, like a hammer that shatters the rock. And that brings us to the figs and the future. 
In 597 BC, Babylon deported that king with so many names, with the officials and the key citizens, and only the poor remained. He shows Jeremiah two baskets of figs. He said, what do you see? Don't you love simple questions? I see some very good figs. What would you do with them? You'd preserve them. You would look forward to them. You would put them in a, in a cake and, and give them to somebody, you see. Bad figs. Oh, and I know that Lynn put the good figs in here. I had all, absolute confidence. Well, well, the good, good figs are the ones that will survive in Babylon. Here's this, again, reverse of what they might have expected. If you stay and you fight and you resist, or if you flee to Egypt, you're going to go down. And the bad figs represent the result of bad seed, bad treatment. It's kind of like we saw with the, the potter and the clay. The figs here have a part to play in their own future. Just like the clay is not totally uh, uh, without initiative. And so the figs are going to get what they deserve because they've chosen to be those figs that lean on God or those figs that... Coming up next week, chapters 25 to 33... Uh, keep sending those questions and comments in and keep bringing those cakes and everything will go great. Just keep up the good work. What an example for the entire class.